You know what Hearthstone really needed? More pirates for Warrior. That's right. This is the colossal minion for uh, for Warrior. And of course, I jest. I think some people are going to be frustrated by this one, but let's talk about it. It's Nelly the Great Thresher, a seven mana five five beast for Warrior Colossal plus one. So you're going to get one Nelly's pirate ship when you play this or whatever it gets summoned. And Battlecry, discover three pirates to crew Nelly's ship. So you're picking three pirate buddies. Then the pirate ship over there has Taunt. It's a 2-6. And Death Rattle, add Nelly's pirate crew to your hand. They cost one. So you're correct. You could get three one mana Mr. Smites out of Nelly's pirate ship if you get just insanely lucky and discover three Mr. Smites. Alternatively, and more likely, is you get maybe one Mr. Smite and a couple other you know, medium to large pirates that are still a ridiculous burst combo for then a total of three mana since they're all going to cost one on top of any other pirates you might have lingering around in hand or on board from the juggernaut with that summon. So yes, this is a scary potential payoff because uh, some people on Reddit were doing the math. I haven't double checked this, but based on the current number of pirates available for warriors to discover, and the multiple discovers, because you're picking three different rounds of three, apparently there's nearly a 50% chance that you'll find a Mr. Smite. Please feel free to do the math in the comments to double check all that. There's some complications when it comes to discover stuff that doesn't make it that simple to solve. We also don't know officially how many pirates will be in the pool, and there could be more throughout the course of the year. But still for now, a very scary proposition even if it's way less than 50%, uh, even one fifth of the time, it's going to suck to lose to that crazy burst potential from a one mana Mr. Smite. Now, all that said, is this card going to be played? Because if it's not played, who cares? Uh, I think there's a pretty solid chance, actually. Some people are saying this is too slow for quest pirate warrior. I'm not 100% sold on that. The way that deck works, it, it Sounds like an aggro deck, but it's really kind of a grindy mid-range deck in many cases. It often takes them three or four rounds with the Juggernaut to start to overwhelm people. And I think a card like Nelly could slot into those late game turns for Quest Pirate Warrior and be a pretty powerful addition. Uh, it's got immediate board presence plus this ridiculous upside off of the Death Rattle. So... I think this could be the top end of a quest warrior deck and still be pretty relevant to that deck closing out games because it gives you like an extra burst potential. Mr. Smite already does that for that deck. This is kind of the next step in that evolution and it might be worth it. Could still be too disruptive to your early curve because it's not a pirate. It is seven mana, right? There's it's going to be close, but I think it might actually make the cut. But even outside of quest part where you're, I think like a control deck can run this card, actually. It's got some defensive presence on board with a taunt. It's not great, but there will be turns where you can still slot this in successfully. And then it gives you finisher potential for a control deck or just tons of extra value for a control deck as well. It won't be optimized enough for some really refined defensive lists, but there will be a lot of decks that can just kind of throw this in as a freebie, I think. It lives on its own. It does its own thing. It doesn't need support or synergies to thrive. It's just got some high payout potential. So I think Nelly's actually good enough for Quest Warrior, which isn't the best deck right now, but could definitely get there with a rotation and uh, a lower overall power uh, meta. And I think this is probably good beyond that as well. So I think Nelly the Great Thresher is a pretty darn uh, powerful card. All right, next up here is a new Amalgam. It's Amalgam of the Deep. We got a fishy Amalgam, looks great. Uh, two mana, two, three, all type, of course, because it's an Amalgam. And Battlecry, choose a friendly minion, discover a minion of the same minion type. So uh, this is basically a way to get extra stuff 
of the stuff that you like. And by the way, no, you can't use this on itself and get another one in an in infinite loop. It appears if you discover this on an amalgam, it just picks a random uh, minion type. In the reveal video, for instance, from Tice, he used it and he got an elemental despite targeting an amalgam of the deep. So no fun shenanigans there, unfortunately. Um, now, as for the utility of this card, I have to admit, I, I think it's pretty low. I basically see this as a way to like fill in the gaps on some kind of minion type list. If you care about beasts, for instance, with beast druid, this could be an extra beast that gets you an extra beast. But uh, this is basically, uh, you know, directionless value that isn't always good for those sorts of decks. Like beast druid doesn't need random beasts. They need specific stuff that's enacting an aggressive game plan. And this is just that river crocolisk body that doesn't have any upside except another random card in hand that might be, you know, ex too expensive across the discover options. It might just not be synergistic or really all that great of a fit. So I don't know how many decks are going to care about this. Maybe there's some world where there's just a limited enough minion type pool that you can get some really consistent results. But I don't think that seems particularly likely either. So. Uh, this just seems like a filler card, and I think if you're going to have filler cards that are discovering stuff, you'd rather have ones that are finding spells, for instance. Those are often offering a little bit more instant reactivity than just random minions. I think the average spell is much higher quality than an average minion of a minion type. So even if it does fit your deck well, it's just not that great. There are better options probably for almost every deck out there. I just don't see Amalgam of the Deep getting a lot of play. So next up here is the Garden's Grace, a new 10 mana spell for Paladin. It's give a minion plus five, plus five in Divine Shield, and it costs one less for each mana you've spent on holy spells this game. So some more holy spell synergy stuff popping up here. All the stuff we've seen from Paladin so far is all about holy spells. You can see the synergistic package coming together rather nicely. Now, how good is the Garden's Grace at 10 mana? Of course, garbage. Nobody wants to pay 10 mana for this, but it's going to get discounted over the course of the game. I think it becomes a solid card around the 5 mana spot. That's where you're like, okay, that makes sense to me. And gets good, like 4, 3, uh, really good. Of course, you get it down to like 2, 1, or 0. That's going to be a hyper-efficient buff uh, for its mana cost. But how easy is it to get to those thresholds? I would argue not that easy. There's this tenuous balance that has to exist in a deck if you're running a deck that cares about stat buffs like this one and other maybe holy buffs as well you have to have a balance between minions and spells if you have too many buffs there's nothing to buff or you know if you don't want to be hero powering that's a pretty inefficient mana usage right so you've got to have enough minions and you got to have enough buffs and it's like well, okay, if I'm playing mostly minions in the early game, this isn't getting discounted very quickly, right? If I have too many buffs to discount this quickly, I'm going to break the structure of the deck because I don't have enough minions. My worry is that the Garden's Grace is only going to get discounted to a good level pretty late in a game. You know, if you're playing this uh, on turn six for two mana, that's where it's exciting. Maybe even turn seven, turn eight. But that's not as impactful. You need the big crazy stat stuff early in the game. That's when you can leverage that tempo and that initiative to overwhelm your opponents before they have time to either initiate their win condition via some combo deck or find the tools necessary to keep up with your tempo and stabilize. Both this and Kotari make me really nervous that you're going to have to spend too much mana. So the one hope for this card, actually, that it's going to give it the three star rating it's going to get instead of a two star rating is the fact that, you know, you can plop it on a taunt or lifesteal minion and that could work nicely in a deck that has some perfect targets and bodies for it. And you can maybe save these up till they get to zero mana for something like a charge OTK combo with Mr. Smite, where you've got a smite plus two of these for 16 damage and something else. Who knows, right? Some copies or something. So there are potential ways for this to get played. I just don't actually think it's going to be the kind of consistent uh, tempo buff paladin stuff that a lot of people are expecting. I think it's going to have to be shenanigans or really specific use cases for it, which of course limit its widespread use and keep it from being something that's likely to be very commonly seen or super meta defining. Nelly the Great Thresher is a four star card. Amalgam of the Deep is a two star card. The Garden's Grace is a three star card. And there you go, folks. That's it for this review for Sunken City. Some scary pirate stuff. I have a feeling a lot of people are going to disagree with me about the Paladin card. So, of course, share those thoughts 
I'm just not buying it quite yet. But uh, anyway, thanks so much for watching, and until next time, game on.